In this video, we're gonna talk about gendered space. This has direct relevance to the work of equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's a big conversation. This is part one, and that's coming up right now. I'm Andrea Adams. This is HR Shop Talk, where you get expert insight into HR. I encourage you to subscribe to the show by clicking on the button at the bottom of the screen or to the podcast to keep learning from my smart and experienced guests. Today, my guest is Alicia Bjornsson. Alicia is an expert on gendered space. She has a STEM background and got curious about why so many people were leaving that environment. Hi, Alicia. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. So I have lots of questions. It's a big topic. So let's dive in right away. So you studied gender or you study gendered space. What does that mean? Well, first, let's define what I mean by space. Right. Because space can be physical, as in this rooms that we're in, the companies we work for. But it can also be social and abstract. So, for example, let's think of political space or... um, how we think of ourselves as a company or as a province or as a nation. Those two are in existence, even if they're not physical. And these can overlap and they can intersect. So when I talk about space, it's the space, space is what we inhabit. It's not fixed. It's not natural because it's socially constructed, right? Like all the spaces that we are in, um, Mm -hmm. there is a social component to them. And Mm -hmm. they're mobile, they're fluid, they change all the time. And they're shaped by underlying structures, um, such as gender, religion, colonialism. There's so many different things that structure a space. Mm -hmm. And they're created using unspoken rules and norms. And these norms can uh, decide for us how we should act in a space. Some people call this culture, Mm -hmm. but... It's too simplistic because cultures cultures overlap in these spaces. So we all come from different cultures. Our workplace has a culture. Our families have a culture. Yes. Um, maybe the religious organization we are in have a culture. Our province has a culture. And all these can overlap and intersect. We can act differently in the spaces that we were in. So, for example, let's think about... Um, how do we act at work versus home? How do we act maybe at the theater versus a sporting event? Mm-hmm. Those have different expectations of you um, mm-hmm. of how you should act. But what I like to think about is when we can feel out of place and why. We each have a multitude of identity factors. So mm-hmm. what I mean by this is um, our gender, our race, our ethnicity, our religion, our ability. No mm-hmm. one factor is mutually exclusive or separate from one another. And these identity factors make us who we are. Right. So when we inhabit these spaces, there are certain power structures that organize them. And depending on our individual identity factors, each of us will experience these unspoken structures and power different differently within those spaces. I guess my first question is how has that impacted STEM? Like if you want to relate it back to your expertise. How has gender and space impacted STEM? Well, it's interesting because I would say as a woman in STEM, I had no idea, right? Right. And I would say when I was going to school, when I was working in STEM, there are certain times when um, I maybe felt like something was off or I couldn't understand why just me being who I am, I wasn't accepted. Mm -hmm. And um, there's indications that we're getting a lot better, for example, getting women and under underrepresented people into STEM, but mm-hmm. we're not keeping them. So right. why is that? You can't, there's no way that someone will spend all that time going to university, gaining that knowledge, and then just yeah. say, meh, I don't want to do it anymore. So there's mm-hmm. got to be something about the spaces that we inhabit that make it so that we can't do the work that we want to do maybe we don't feel included in those places. There was a point in time when I was a STEM professional where I looked around and I was like, who are all the people that I know? Yeah. All of a sudden I felt very alone and I didn't understand why. So I went back to school to understand why. And when I did, I learned so many different things about STEM and how even STEM itself has been structured. The knowledge that we create in STEM is 
it, it's a space in its own. And there's, there's a history where science was definitely structured, designed, even executed by majority men. Yes. So there's lots of instances where we can now understand that we've missed knowledge, we've missed understanding, because we need people of, of these varying backgrounds um, in order to understand everything it is about society, because STEM is supposed to be helping society, but how can we help society if we don't actually have the people in STEM of all those different backgrounds to create the knowledge. We'll get into how this applies to the workplace, but I think mm -hmm. it's fairly obvious it's the same ideas, right? But can you talk to what your findings were about why women and diverse people were leaving STEM? Well, it, it's interesting because if you think about the concept of like the word intersectionality, we hear that word all the time. And a lot of people don't understand what that means. Mm -hmm. Now, intersectionality was a concept coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in the 1980s, who was a black feminist and a critical race theorist. And what she noticed is that black women, they were kind of caught in an in-between mm -hmm. where their personal identities, specifically within the political structures, uh, where they were discriminated against because they were women, mm -hmm. but they were also discriminated against because they were black. The reasons why they were discriminated discriminate against, there was an intersection there. Mm -hmm. And it was for different reasons, but they didn't fit into either of those categories. So quite right. often they weren't believed when they didn't fit in or things didn't work. So mm -hmm. that's how this kind of started with the concept of understanding our identity factors and, and, and how they intersect. But when I study space, I, I've come to realize that spaces themselves are intersectional. And what I mean is that there's different power structures mm -hmm. in a space that structure it. Mm -hmm. So there'll be certain times when someone of one background will feel perfectly fine in this space, but not in that space. And it might have something to do with not just them themselves, but how the spaces are structured. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the workplace, we have to understand where is it situated? Um, who works there? What are the histories of why this company even exists? Because all those things will create a reason why people may or may not uh, feel welcome there. Mm -hmm. And so the work I do is structured on a feminist geographer named Doreen Massey. I study specifically gender and how power operates within the structure related to gender and what that means. When I say gender, I mean complex, relative, cultural, not binary, because a traditional norm would think that gender is a binary, meaning male, female, mm -hmm. man, woman, so women's work, men's work, who we will accept in the position. Mm -hmm. Is gender more important than those other concepts that we've talked about in intersectionality? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. It's just the mm -hmm. one that I happen to study and the one that right. I have the expertise right. on. Yes. But what I learned was when you deconstruct this norm of gender, that not only can a space be gendering, meaning that you can feel like you are accepted or not as um, a person of a certain gender, but also that we can reproduce a space. So what I mean is it reinforces gender norms. So yes. by treating people a certain way, you reinforce that that is how someone should be treated in that space. So society produces space and space produces society. It is this loop. If you found this intriguing, subscribe or click like. And the question for today is, is your organization doing equity, diversity and inclusion type work? If so, who's doing it and how's it getting done? Tell us in the comment section. We'll let the audience, I suppose, extrapolate to broader you know, factors of diversity, but around gender. Mm. Talk to me about the genderification, if that's even a word, sure. of, of the workplace. When we're talking specifically about gender, an example you can talk about is sexism. Sometimes some of the men maybe that we work with may not realize that they are um, being sexist or their actions are sexist, but then they have a daughter. And then all of a sudden, the same act happened to her, and then they see the act of sexism through their daughter's eyes. Like this one bugs me, I will definitely say, because like empathy as humans should always be a given, but mm -hmm. yet this is the reactions of gendered space. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. is that when, when we do have gender norms, we can't even see that these things were never acceptable. And you have to have this act of transgression when you are like, oh my goodness, like maybe I should never have acted like that. Yeah, no, you shouldn't have. That's why these things sometimes happen slowly as opposed mm-hmm. to abruptly, mm-hmm. uh, which can be, can be very frustrating. But mm-hmm. when you think of like sexism and the structures of sexism, well, harassment and discrimination legislation targets the more blunt and forms of gender prejudice, mm-hmm. day-to-day mm-hmm. sexism very much is still present mm-hmm. and it can manifest in subtle ways. And the topic Mm -hmm. of sexism is often dismissed as, say, a problem from the past, or that may happen in other cultures or other workplaces, but it definitely doesn't happen here. Mm -hmm. Um, And for women, sometimes we can even not be able to identify subtle sexism Mm -hmm. because it is the way it's always been. So you've Mm -hmm. always just had to adjust yourself to fit, right? Right. And so for women, they can even deny experiencing gender prejudice, maybe even blame the negative experiences that they experience on their own shortcomings. So you internalize it. You say, well, it must be because of me or something that I've done, or I must lack lack confidence or insecurity. This is why I'm not progressing or um, getting success. Or maybe there's just this unwritten or perceived understanding that men are just better at certain tasks or that certain spaces are just m- not meant for women. So for example, if you look at STEM, the yeah. going to the field, I've heard STEM women say how um, there's no place for them to stay or bathrooms for them to use or, and those kinds of things. So then those spaces don't even open to them as a possibility, but yet that in order to progress in your, in your profession, you may need a stint in the field to get that check mark in order to right. be a STEM professional. Right. So right. These, these gendered spaces can really limit people um, to certain experiences that they need. Right. But also by de- denying sexism in this way, it can serve as a way to and a strategy for women to actually protect themselves. And it enables them to maintain a sense of personal control. So you just you just change yourself. Mm. You're not yourself anymore. You just um, assimilate Mm -hmm. in order to be accepted. Mm -hmm. But that can be really jarring over time. And and like, how long do we all last not being who we really are? So in in these gendered masculine spaces, um, these attitudes can and actions can become institutionalized. And the Mm -hmm. patterns just get reestablished through use. Mm-hmm. So, so much so that it gets reproduced almost independently without us even trying. And yeah. this is, this can become those institutionalized cultures. Right. And so then the whole company becomes a gendered space, for example, or the whole group right. you're in. So often individuals are encouraged or rewarded to participate in these, for example, sexist cultures, including women who become complicit in its reproduction and to address the act of sexism as inappropriate, it requires a social and physical density, making it a tangible thing. Because then once we actually can name it, then we can point it out and address it. And even in institutions where diversity and inclusion are top of mind, these these can be prominent, uninvited cultures that just still persist. Mm -hmm. And it is because power is always present in every space that we're in. So you were talking about it a, a little bit and you're, it's manifesting in subtle ways. So how do you, like, how does this whole thing get disrupted? How do we do something about it? Like I said, we have to name it. We have to call it out. We have to actually see the behavior as something that's not accept, being accepted. And for some companies, it may be that they realize, geez, we've lost like five women in a row. Why can't we keep women in the group or in the company before they realized, gee, it might not be the women. It might be actually us or like that are causing this space to right. be so it's not welcoming to them. The onus is for a long time has been on the women to make the change or the women to change. Right. So the focus has been on this individual actions that Mm -hmm. the women have to change the space or the women have to change to be in those spaces. And so if we're going to make change, we have to make a change to the institution because, you know, the, the act of trying to get the women to change, we've been doing that for 30 years, 40 years, 
And this is why one day I looked up and I didn't see any women anymore because you get to right. a point where you're just like, I'm done. I can't make this work for me. I can't make yeah. it work for my family. Yeah. I'm not enjoying my time here and they leave. I hear talk that uh, this sort of thing harms men as well. So can you, talk, can, can you talk to me about that? As I said, every space we inhabit is always gendered. Nothing's ever gender neutral. And um, one of the mistakes a company can make is make the assumption that the policies that they create or the spaces that they create are gender neutral. Just heads up, they're never gender neutral. Uh, this can mean that maybe certain jobs or certain positions in a company can be considered women's work or men's work. So that's one way. And so, for example, in the resource sector that I was in, the oil and gas sector, for example, the, this space has long been gendered male, yes. meaning that often within this space, it is only ever women who are seen to have gender and it is only ever a problem for women. What I mean by that is how often do you hear about a man engineer? Do you ever hear that? Oh, that man engineer. <laughs> you never hear that. But you sure hear about the woman engineer. Like there's oh, somewhere God. along the way yes. where an engineer, an engineer, an engineer, and all of a sudden you become a woman engineer. This is why women can then identify that, wait a second, I don't, I don't fit here because I have to actually give myself um, a okay. you normal know, culture at the front of it in order to even exist. So this, that means the men get ignored. It means that when spaces don't fit for them, you can't even name it, Right. So absolutely, there's still instances where a gendered space can affect men, specifically when they're very highly masculinized spaces, like maybe the oil and gas sector. So men too can feel out of place, maybe not feeling like they can speak up, for example, when they're uncomfortable. And right. this is why EDI can be so linked to like um, health, safety and environment kind of concept, because right. there's instances where... Um, it is just not the manly thing to do to speak up when you do not feel safe. So a highly masculinized space can very much just as much affect men as it can women. And men may actually, because they haven't been gendered in this space, because it is their gendered space, yeah. unlike the woman engineer, <laughs> they don't feel that spot where they can speak up. Men may then try to self-medicate uh, they just got to get through the next shift. They just got to make sure they, they can get through. So you start taking the painkillers. You see how I, you can escalate, right? right. So gendered right. space can just as much affect men as it can women, right. just in different ways. In all of this, we have to think about the greater uh, contextual factors of toxic masculinity. And when I say toxic masculinity, I mean the social norm and social expectations of how men should behave in society. So not just within our workplace, but within our greater society, the expectations of men, um, of their behaviors uh, on them. And that if you do not maybe behave in certain ways as a man, yeah. Yeah. that you can be out of place. Right. It's like this unspoken culture and men are policed not just by other men, but by women as well, Yes, um, that they have to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. And as I said, space can be gendered and be gendering. So um, when, you, when you, you layer all these up, um, gendered space definitely affects both men and women. Wow. That was conclusive. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Alicia. That was enlightening to say the least. I look forward to part two of our conversation and we'll catch you all next time in that episode. Thanks for watching.